Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. In December, outgoing President Donald Trump pulled one more shocking foreign policy decision when he recognized Morocco's claim to Western Sahara in exchange for Morocco normalizing with Israel. Western Sahara has been disputed since the Spanish withdrew in 1975, and the conflict between Morocco and the Polisario Front, an armed liberation movement, continued until the 1991 ceasefire. Last year, the Polisario Front, which is backed by neighboring Algeria, declared the ceasefire over. Most recently, the Moroccans expressed fury after the leader of the Polisario was given medical treatment in Spain, and the Moroccans retaliated by unleashing refugees into Spanish territory. Jacob Mundy is an associate professor of peace and conflict studies and Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at Colgate University. He recently published a report for the European Council on Foreign Relations, where he's a visiting fellow, proposing creating new solutions on the decades old problem. The report is entitled Free to Choose a New Plan for Peace in Western Sahara. He joins me today to discuss this and other areas of his expertise, including Libya and Algeria. Jacob, welcome. It's great to be with you. It's so good to have you. I'm really excited to talk about this issue in particular because it doesn't get that much attention, at yeah. least in US progressive circles, which is mostly what our audience is. So I'm really excited to sort of delve into it and talk about it because this is sort of an occupation that we don't ever really hear about. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, can you start, and this is gonna be a pretty big question, but by giving our listeners and viewers some background on this conflict, how did it start? When did it start? How did it progress uh, to get to where we are today? Yeah, well, if we go back to the Spanish colonial period, that began in 1885. Uh, Spain was sort of a, a late uh, entry into the, the great scramble for Africa that Europe was embarked upon in the 1880s. And it wasn't really an important colony for the Spanish, uh, but they held on to it for relatively longer than most other countries. So Libya is independent in 1951, Morocco 56, Algeria 62. But by the early 1970s, Spain is still in the Spanish Sahara and actually tried to annex it as a province of Spain, just to sort of say, no, this isn't a colony, this is a province. And so in the early 1970s, an indigenous uh, independence movement, which eventually formed around the Polisario Front was created and launched a war against Spain in 1973. Uh, by 1974, there was a huge amount of pressure internally from the guerrilla movement, but also from the international community. The, U the UN had designated uh, the Spanish Sahara, a non-self-governing territory, a colony uh, in the mid-1960s, and the UN General Assembly was ritually every year calling for its independence. So Spain announced in 1974 that it was going to organize a referendum on independence uh, for the territory. This sort of created a crisis because Morocco had raised a territorial claim to Western Sahara. So had ne neighboring Mauritania, but that becomes kind of a side note historically. Uh, Morocco goes to the International Court of Justice seeking an opinion, and the Court of Justice says, no, there's no historical evidence that there were any strong ties between Morocco and Western Sahara, and the, the territory, regardless, is uh, owed its uh, self-determination and its right to independence. So confronted with this uh, decision from the court, Morocco decides to launch a kind of interesting game of chicken uh, with Spain, where they threaten uh, military invasion if Spain doesn't allow a symbolic march of 350,000 Moroccans to walk into the territory. At the UN, the United States made sure that the Security Council didn't really do much uh, to oppose Morocco's threats of aggression. And so Spain was kind of forced to cut a deal with Morocco. Uh, and so there was a, a three-way deal where Spain would leave the territory, then Morocco and Mauritania would gain the ter territory. At this point, Algeria becomes very much involved because they viewed this as an affront to their uh, interests in the region, and they begin to really throw their weight behind the independence movement, the Polisario Front. So then basically we get a war uh, for the next 15 years from 76 to 1991. The United Nations shows up in 1991 promising a referendum on independence, the very thing that Morocco had invaded in 1975 to prevent. Uh, the UN attempts to organize this referendum uh, for the next about uh, nine years until about the year 2000, when the UN suddenly gets cold feet uh, uh, in terms of actually holding a referendum because they realize that there's a problem, that uh, if the territory votes for independence, uh, what are we gonna do to actually force Morocco to leave the, the territory? And so then they begin to kind of search for 
a different way to approach it. What the, what the UN really wants, or at least the Security Council, right, the people who really hold power in this conflict, uh, what they want is an agreement between Polisario and Morocco before there's any kind of referendum, because that you know, so you don't get an East Timor type scenario where you know the the population votes for independence, but the occupying country says no, we're not gonna we're not gonna recognize it. So there's been an effort to kind of push for a political solution ahead of uh, a vote on independence. But increasingly, what we've seen over the past 20 years is that Morocco has become more and more comfortable with its position and more and more comfortable with just basically saying. Uh, we're willing to grant the territory autonomy, but not not to negotiate anything further. Uh, and in fact, the Moroccan representative at the UN uh, in front of the decolonization committee the other day basically said, you know, uh, Western Sahara has no right to self-determination and they can accept autonomy or not, but that's, that's all we're offering. So that's sort of where things were politically leading up to these really uh, monumental changes at the end of 2020 when Polisario resumed armed attacks against Morocco, having halted them in 1991, and then Trump's recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara, which is probably the, uh, I would say, the most explicit recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara that any country in the world has given, and thus puts the United States quite at odds with international law. No, that's a really excellent point. I'm glad that you brought it to the Trump recognition because, um, you know, so just just so people know, Trump did recognize Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara in exchange for Morocco normalizing relations with Israel as a part of, uh, you know, this Trump Kushner Abraham Accords trying to get all these countries in the regions to, norm to normalize with Israel. So can you elaborate a bit on the significance of that recognition? Um, because it was pretty, it was pretty jarring. I think for the world community to basically recognize uh, Morocco as as being in charge of this area that's been under occupation, like it totally changed uh, the entire conflict. No. Yeah, it was it's certainly um, something that did. I mean, it didn't come out of nowhere. There, there was reporting in the Israeli press um, and other sources that hinted that this this deal was being cooked up where we were getting uh, a possible quid pro quo where Morocco would renormalize with Israel. Morocco had normalized relations with Israel, but they were suspended during the second Tabada. And so uh, we knew that this was in the works, but no one really thought that th that this would this would happen. Uh, that you know cooler heads would prevail typically the state department kind of says no don't you know don't don't do anything too aggressive on western sahara there's a lot of different kind of relations entangled in all this and we don't want to upset the cart but trump made a, a very rash decision possibly just out of kind of frustration with james inhofe i mean there's sort of these weird sort of stories about uh you know how this kind of temperamental flare-up between Inhofe and Trump, Inhofe's a supporter of Western Sahara, led to Trump just saying, "Okay, we're going to do it. We're going to recognize Moroccan sovereignty." Uh, and so uh, that sort of you know sets the stage for uh, the U.S. Uh, engaging more in the territory. There was a, a the opening of a symbolic consulates in one of the cities in Western Sahara by the outgoing uh, U.S. ambassador. Um, to Morocco, the consulate now sits empty. It hasn't been funded. The the Congress is holding up a lot of these sort of strings that are attached uh, to this deal, uh, while the policy itself remains under review officially by the uh, the Biden administration. So, uh, whether or not they'll continue to recognize Moroccan sovereignty is, seems to be an open question. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit more about the general conflict before we branch out into like who's supporting which side. Because yeah. I think what's so fascinating about this issue is it doesn't get that much attention, but the entire world seems to be pretty involved, particularly like the different <laughs> EU countries, the US, yeah. the neighboring countries. Um, but the specific conflict in general, you have Morocco obviously on one side, you have the Polisario front on the other. What does each side want? What are they fighting for? And what is Morocco's interest? Like, why does Morocco care so much about Western Sahara? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, on the, the Polisario side, it's uh, it's just a classic independence movement uh, that comes out of the anti-colonial period of the, the 1960s, 1970s. These were, Sah the, the founders were Sahrawis, is, is Arabic for Western Saharan. Uh, they uh, you know, were grew up and educated in the milieu of other sorts of independence movements and, and read, you know, Francis Fanon and, you know, were inspired by Algeria and other 
uh, movements around Africa and the Middle East, Arab nationalism, uh, Gaddafi's revolution, um, Nasser's revolution, things like that. So uh, Pulsario was founded in, in that sort of vein. Uh, they've evolved into kind of more of a classic front type ANC type organization that accommodates a lot of different sort of tendencies from sort of Islamist tendencies, conservative nationalists, all the way to, you know, very left wing sorts of tendencies. Um, and so the Polisario is a political body that has a, runs a state in exile that's partially recognized. It has full membership rights as a state in the African Union. At one point, it had been recognized uh, bilaterally by over 70 states around the world, though there's been some uh, loss of that recognition in recent years. Uh, but that's that's what Western Sahara nationalism stands for. And uh, unfortunately, because of Morocco's invasion in 1975, 76, about 40% of the population was forced to flee into exile. So they've been living in refugee camps in Algeria. So the, the Western Saharans themselves are divided about 60, 40, 60% live under Moroccan occupation and 40% live in these refugee camps. For Morocco, the, the claim on Western Sahara is mainly ideological to begin with. It's the idea that Morocco was a much bigger country before the onset of European colonialism. Um, and the uh, these claims were announced about as Morocco became independent in 1956. They weren't pursued very aggressively. They include parts of uh, Northern Mali, Western Algeria, all of Mauritania, even down into Senegal, according to some maps. Uh, but really, Morocco uh, chose to recognize its neighbors and didn't want to create problems with the, the fascist regime, regime of Franco in the 1960s. However, the, uh, the Moroccan regime uh, began to experience a, a series of crises and challenges in the early 1970s. There were several coup attempts that tried to kill King Hassan II, uh, possibly to create a, uh, a military-style regime. Um, and so the the monarchy, which was challenged by you know labor movements, left movements, student movements, and then also uh, by its own military, seized upon this crisis in Western Sahara to kind of divert national attention from the internal crises that were brewing, right? Because the 1970s is the decade uh, in which uh, a lot of um, you know post independence projects get upset by rising global inflation, the oil crises, and, and things like that. So the King of Morocco uses this campaign to recover Western Sahara. Remember the International Court of Justice said there were no ties of sovereignty and that the Western Saharans themselves were the sovereign power in Western Sahara. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Hassan II definitely used this, this national campaign to take Western Sahara from Spain. Uh, they succeeded surprisingly because of the uh, uh, sort of passive response of the Security Council uh, and behind the scenes, I declassified information that showed that Kissinger basically wanted Morocco to get to get the territory. Uh, ah, he shows up everywhere, doesn't he? <laughs> he, <laughs> he, every <cer> conflict. <laughs> he, he certainly does. It, it was an interesting time. It's actually the I, you know, East Timor was invaded uh, a few months later. So it's a very momentous period. Uh, now, there's a lot of discussions about whether or not Western Tower is a resource conflict because it's the territory is rich in phosphates and Morocco is already one of the world's most uh, significant producers of phosphates. In many ways, it's kind of the, the Saudi Arabia of phosphates because of its export capacity. And so control over Western Tower gives Morocco more control over uh, its monopoly sort of power on the world market. Uh, but that's not the reason it was invaded. It was more to solidify the regime secure a social basis of support to discipline the military but also give the military something to do uh, and in recent years fisheries have actually become the key element here and this this is where as you mentioned right this begins to implicate eu partners you know not only is france morocco's number one uh, trading partner uh, but spain is the number one beneficiary of these eu fisheries deals that include the waters off western sahara which european courts have continually struck down as illegal time and time again but the eu seems to come back and think that well if we can if we can you know engineer some sort of consent of the the people who are being exploited then you know then it's kosher right and that's that's I'm glad you brought it to the EU because there's this really uh, and you write this in the report that you that you produced for the European uh, Council of Foreign Relations. You talk about this really contradictory role uh, from these EU countries where on the one hand, the EU has a stance 
And then on the other hand, you have countries like Spain that have their own take. There you have France, you have Germany. So can you break that down? What is the EU's yeah. position on this occupation? Is it constructive? And then how does that differ between what specific countries like Spain or France want or don't want or who they back? Yeah, well, uh, the EU as a whole doesn't have a Western sovereign policy and they're not allowed to because of powerful states uh, like France and Spain who are heavily invested. France is basically views itself as the guarantor of stability in Morocco. And this is part of not only those trade relations I mentioned, but they, they obviously have a lot to do with it, but sort of the, the wider sort of French sphere of influence in Africa uh, that is mainly located in West Africa, but Morocco has become a very important aspect of that of that picture of French uh, dominance over the region. And the, the Moroccan monarchy coordinates very closely with French state interests uh, to advance them on uh, a mutual basis. Uh, the Moroccan regime itself is kind of transformed into a you know a kind of financial regional powerhouse that's looking to. Uh, in its own ways, uh, develop its own kind of form of Moroccan capital that can be invested abroad. Uh, and so Moroccan in investments are great because the, you know, the tolerance for corruption is much higher than you would get with like European states that are being overseen by the EU. Uh, for Spain, the relationship is a bit more complicated as the former colonial power in Western Sahara. Uh, technically speaking, Spain is the administering power, which is a UN term for basically the colonizing power. Uh, the UN had a legal ruling in 2002 that states really can't divest themselves of that responsibility as a colonizing power. And so technically, uh, Spain should be the, you know, the one who's in charge of Western Sahara, but Morocco is illegally occupying it. Uh, now, popular sentiments in Spain are overwhelmingly in support of Western sovereign independence, and this is across the political spectrum. So, you know, former Francoists, uh, you know, who feel that they have a kind of duty to the, the colony uh, to deliver its independence uh, to far, far left movements. Uh, and more recently, you see uh, issues developing between Morocco and Podemos, because voices within Podemos have said things very sympathetic uh, to Western Sahara. So at the same time, uh, the fisheries uh, between Western Sahara and the Canary Islands is one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. And so this is essential for Spanish uh, fishing industry. Um, and so you see policy almost being driven by, you know, these special interests in Spain that basically disable the European Union from having a common policy. Uh, now, Germany has recently raised some uh, concerns about this. One, because the United States no longer appears to be the neutral uh, player in all this, the kind of role that the U.S. had had maintained uh, for a long time, even if it was clearly biased towards Morocco. Uh, and so Germany seems to be showing more interest, but uh, it'll be difficult to uh, have a common EU policy because that basically would mean uh, France and Spain would have to would have to back up and let let the the EU take charge. And if the EU is taking its its lead from its own legal uh, from its courts, then then obviously the policy would have to be uh, not only uh, much more neutral and not pro Moroccan, but uh, something based in international law, which is very clear when it comes to Western Sahara's right to self determination, including independence. Yeah, it's interesting how these like former colonial powers are still kind of <laughs> duking yeah. it out yeah. on yeah. these issues. And then I want to bring in the issue of Algeria. You kind of um, you alluded to it before, but you mentioned that something like 40 percent of the population in um, Western Sahara was pushed out uh, when this conflict started. Um, and they were ended up in these refugee camps in Algeria where they're still they still uh, live today. Um, and then there's also this issue of Morocco giving financial incentives to its own population to go settle in Western Sahara, yeah. which gives it a very Israeli-Palestine uh, vibe. But yeah. with the issue of Algeria, why? Like, what is Algeria's position in this? They they basically support the Palestinian Front. Why do they support the Palestinian Front? Is that their own issues? Is it, is it their own issues with Morocco? Uh, what's what's driving that? Yeah, there, I, there's different reasons for Algerian support and it's changed uh, somewhat uh, over time. As I mentioned uh, earlier, Algeria only began to really support Polisario after Morocco invaded in 1975. And this was largely because Algeria felt that 
and, and this is actually borne out by the historical record, that Western powers had colluded with Morocco behind Algeria's back to uh, change the borders of North Africa, uh, including a border that touches upon Algeria. And Algeria felt that this was a, a serious affront to its its strategic interests. Uh, now, Algerian Morocco didn't get off to a good start after independence because Morocco invaded Algeria in 1963. There was a short thing called the, the Sand War, which the Organization of African Unity mediated and, and re, uh, resolved. But uh, from that point onward, Algeria took Morocco very seriously when Morocco talked about this idea of greater Morocco, that uh, Morocco was interested in, in seizing and advancing its territory. Uh, so when Morocco invaded Western Sahara, uh, Algeria felt that, well, you know, it's time for us to really stand up for these uh, the, these displaced people, the, the Western Saharans, whose interests have been entirely marginalized in this entire affair where Spain and Morocco and Mauritania went behind everyone's back and cut, and cut a deal and the UN Security Council didn't lift a finger, even though Spain said, hey, we're about to be invaded by Morocco and the United States made sure that Security Council didn't, didn't do anything about it. Um, and so uh, Algeria has uh, a strategic interest, but also, uh, you know, for Algeria, it's, it's one of the, the few states in the world that uh, for a long time has been very much committed to uh, the inviability of colonial borders, respect for popular uh, sovereignty, right? Algeria is a country born of, you know, not only a, a, a very long-term colonization effort, you know, probably the, the oldest in the uh, Islamic world, but uh, a vicious war of independence that, you know, having to fight tooth and nail to, to drive the French out of Algeria has given the country a kind of political culture that is uh, very much different than what you would get in, in Morocco, which is centered around the monarchy. Uh, and so the ideas of, of popular sovereignty and socialism and things like that still resonate, you know, for for Algeria, uh, you know. And so when Algeria looks out in the world and sees, you know, what happened to Syria, sees interventions in Libya, you know, they they take that very seriously as an affront to the, you know, the, the rules based international order, which we're supposed to care so much about these days. Um, and so for Algeria, the, these principles are actually very, very important, the principle of self-determination. Uh, but that's not to say that they don't have some sort of strategic benefit of keeping Morocco um, a, a bit unstable because of the, the Western Sahara issue. It's not it's not a huge expense for Algeria to support uh, the Polisario movement and to provide aid to the Western Saharan refugees, but the Western Saharan refugees also get international aid um, as well. And I just want to clarify, I mean, these are these people are stateless, much like Palestinians are, yeah. right? Like they don't have citizenship anywhere. Um, and, you yeah. know, I wish I could pull it up, actually, that you had uh, in your report, you had this incredible map that showed the the wall that Morocco has built uh, across Western Sahara. And it's a very small, a, a bit major part of it is actually occupied by Morocco. And there's just a very small sliver of it on the other side of the wall that's administered by the Polisario Front, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what's the purpose of that wall, I assume, is just to chop it in half and, you know, make it impossible for this indigenous group to have sovereignty over their own territory, I would assume. Well, it's actually a defense, uh, defensive, me offensive measure, depending on how you look at it. Um, mm -hmm. It was created in mainly in the 1980s, because in the, the late 1970s, Pulsario was a very successful guerrilla movement. They, they, you know, they had indigenous knowledge of the territory. They could strike at will. They, you know, attack and, and run away. They even launched attacks into, into southern Morocco, and so Morocco was very much uh, uh, on, you know, not able to really get a grip on the territory because Polisario was being such a fa fabulous insurgency in the early years. But then Morocco got this idea, uh, and some people say it's from from Israeli advisors, but I didn't see convincing evidence of that. Uh, but to to basically uh, secure Western Sahara slowly by building uh, heavily mined and patrolled walls. So these are dug out of the dirt, uh, stuffed with mines. And what they did was they, over the course of the 1980s, uh, with huge amounts of aid from the United States, Saudi Arabia basically funded uh, Morocco's war in Western Sahara, uh, that they built this uh, uh, series of walls that eventually ended in the one that we know today, which is the Berm which runs from Southern Morocco to the, the coast near Mauritania, 2,700 kilometers. Uh, and it's one of the most mined defensive barriers in the world. 
tens of thousands of Moroccan soldiers are positioned along the walls. Most of the fighting that we read about, so Polisario attacks on a daily basis, are happening against against this firm. But basically, it was this measure by the Moroccans to deny Polisario freedom of movement and to, uh, as you mentioned earlier, facilitate the colonization of the territory. And that also included the importation of settlers, either for economic reasons or other reasons, uh, to begin to kind of skew and uh, change the demographic po profile of the territory. I mean, this is essentially like the last colonized African territory. Would that be accurate to say? Yeah, I mean, you, you can you can Google, you know, a UN list of non-self-governing territories. So <laughs> there's, you know, over a dozen. Most are American possessions or British possessions, you know, small islands, uh, things like that around the world. But then you look at the map of Africa, and there's, you know, this Colorado sized chunk in uh, Northwest Africa that's, you know, a kind of gray spot. And what is that? Uh, well, if you look at the footnote, it has, it mentions, you know, that Spain tried to divest itself of responsibility in 1976. And it doesn't mention or say that Morocco has any uh, responsibility in the territory. And so that's why we call it an occupation because the, the Moroccan presence there has no uh, firm grounding. And then, um, you know, you write about the UN Security Council role in your report. You write the UN Security Council and its permanent members, which have shepherded peace talks since the 1990s, hold much responsibility for the state of affairs. Under their watch, self-determination and decolonization were replaced with a peace process that has given Morocco veto power over how the, Sahra the Sahrawi people fulfill their internationally recognized rights. So can you elaborate a bit on that, on the role um, or the response of the UN Security Council and whether that's been, I guess in this case, it's been a negative role, but can you yeah. discuss that a bit further? Yeah, so the when Morocco invaded in 1975, the issue um, was uh, the, the UN said, well, it's uh, decolonization hasn't taken place and we don't know what to do. Uh, and the Organization of African Unity, which we now call the African Union, uh, said, well, let, well, we'll try to mediate. And so they put together a series of um, talks between the parties, shell diplomacy, things of that sort. And what they stumbled upon was a formula that the UN would eventually adopt, which was there would be a ceasefire, uh, the refugees would come home, and there'd be a vote on independence or integration with Morocco. Uh, now, integration with Morocco was already a concession because the you know Western Sahara uh, you know has no historical ties to Morocco, according to the international. Court of Justice, but the, the Western Sahara independence movement was willing to accept this um, as opposed to what is basically the norm in decolonization situations, which is outright independence. You know, it's, there's very few exceptions uh, to that being the case. Uh, and so the organization African Unity is uh, only is able to get this so far because the organization eventually recognizes Western Sahara as a member state with Polisario as the, the government. Uh, in, uh, that it basically seats in 1984. The UN picks up the issue and again, secures Moroccan and uh, Western Saharan agreements uh, to the same framework, you know, ceasefire, repatriation and uh, referendum on independence. And both sides apparently agreed to it um, without meeting face to face to sort of agree to all the like nitty gritty details about like, well, who's gonna vote? How do we identify the native population for the vote? Things like that. All of these issues are eventually settled in 1997 uh, through a series of negotiations through the first personal envoy to Western Sahara of the Secretary General, which was James Baker, former US Secretary of State. And so that's the only signed agreement we've ever had between Morocco and Polisario. And that was basically an agreement to like, let's hold a referendum on independence. Uh, we're gonna identify uh, the, the electorate uh, and then do that. But then two things happened uh, uh, and an important sort of background note is very few very few people in the UN thought that this vote would ever take place. They really thought that uh, they were gonna push this as far as they could and then see at what point Morocco would say, okay, we, you know, we're not gonna win a vote on independence. So let's, you know, let's see what sort of power sharing we can, we can come up with. So there was a lot of faith in the UN in the referendum uh, to begin with, but then a, a kind of crisis moment happens, which is, in the summer of 1999, as the, the voter list is being finalized, uh, which has taken uh, you know, four or five years uh, of work to actually do, uh, you know, mainly because Morocco had tried to flood the polls with Moroccans pretending to be Western Saharans, <laughs> but that's sort of a footnote. <laughs> uh, but the, so 
two things happen. One, the king of Morocco dies, Hassan II, and he's the one who's committed to a referendum on independence. And it's very clear that his son is not as warm to the idea, uh, basically because he's a young, untested ruler and, uh, you know, do you want your first, you know, big thing to be uh, a referendum on independence in Western Sahara? So immediately Morocco's allies begin pushing on the new king to say, you know, you need to think about a different approach. You know, this might not turn out well for you. Uh, the electorate looks very, you know, friendly to independence. And the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, was East Timor. Uh, and that really spooked the Security Council because there you also had a situation where, uh, both sides assumed that they would win the referendum. East Timor won its independence and Indonesia uh, went ballistic and began killing people. And that forced the UN uh, to use uh, forceful humanitarian intervention and Australian special forces show up and all that stuff because basically they, they hadn't prepared for that. So in order to avoid an East Timor scenario in Western Sahara, uh, this new mantra of a negotiated political solution that's mutually acceptable Became, became the framework. But this idea of mutually acceptable basically gives Morocco a kind of veto power. Uh, and so whereas you, whereas you have this very clear framework guiding the peace process from you know, the 1970s to 1999, which was that you know, Western Sahara would have a referendum on independence, that's, that's thrown out the window. And if Morocco says we don't like something, uh, then, then they kind of get their way because it has to be you know, mutually acceptable. I'm curious, um, you know, is there space, is this conflict, if this conflict persists, is there space for possible exploitation of this conflict, like in a way that you might see in the Middle East, for example, is there space for like jihadist exploitation if this persists? Oh yeah, definitely. I, in Mali, in, in 2012, there was uh, a nationalist uprising uh, by Tuareg movements uh, that was eventually sort of hijacked by jihadi actors that had been in the region uh, who had over the course of the previous decade been building up a war chest of money and funds uh, by kidnapping Europeans and then getting getting ransoms for that. Uh, and then there was the uh, added effect of NATO, the NATO Arab League intervention in Libya, which smashed the Libyan state and unleashed a torrent of light arms into the Sahara Sahel region, which were picked up by various armed groups. Uh, and so today, if you look at you know what's going on in the Sahara Sahel region, this is the, the major focus of Islamic State activity. Uh, the Bernikina, uh Niger, Mali Triangle region is uh, widespread violence is going on there. And now France is sort of having this realization that its intervention in Mali since 2013 is becoming their Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so could Western Sahara become a, a Mali-like situation is something that we sort of warned about in the report that, you know, if the situation becomes more and more unstable, the more and more that the Security Council, I mean, the Security Council always hasn't said anything about the fact that the ceasefire is over in Western Sahara. Um, you know, that the situation could easily spiral out of control. And that's something that Algeria, of course, wouldn't uh, tolerate very well to have that kind of, you know, they've already had to deal with instability in the 1990s. There was uh, a direct uh, assault on a natural gas facility in 2013 in Algeria. So they're, they're very wary of, of this kind of instability, but because they have had poor relations with France, they've been marginalized in, in the region's uh, security apparatuses. But, you know, it's difficult to imagine Algeria sitting idly by if Western Sahara were to become uh, more like a, a Mali type situation. So all of that said, um, what should be done? You know, what should the EU and US be doing? Um, you know, you, you say in the report, France, along with the US, uh, should remove their diplomatic protection from Morocco, both within the EU and the UN. So if that's something they should do, then what? What needs to happen here? Yeah, um, you know the, the Western Sahara issue could, if there was, if there was willingness on the the side of uh, Morocco to actually negotiate, and if there was willingness uh, to put pressure on the parties, especially in Morocco, uh, by the the ones who have enabled the status quo, uh, mainly the United States, France, uh, Spain, um, that if they had actually, you know, would stop this policy of you know pushing the status quo, then. Uh, assume a, a position of neutrality, obviously re rescinding Trump's recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara, and maybe even uh, 
letting the EU handle the issue um, and so that they're, uh, they wouldn't have their interests, right? The, the issue could be resolved fairly quickly. Uh, Polisario is ready, uh, willing to discuss different kinds of power sharing, different ways of figuring out how to um, express self-determination, but there haven't been any substantive talks uh, in Western Sahara really uh, between the parties since 1997. And so uh, in another parallel uh, with Palestine, uh, we've basically just seen a, a totally uh, collapsed peace process uh, and that uh, the, the powerful side, the occupying side has determined that its interests are best pursued uh, by not negotiating, by prolonging the status quo and creating as many facts on the ground uh, so that it's impossible uh, to, uh, to force any other solution than the one that they want. Uh, and so this has been the strategy uh, pursued by Morocco. So the international community has to get very serious about uh, the fact that the uh, you know, serious, serious focus, attention and pressure has to be brought to bear uh, to solve this issue and that Morocco really has to be singled out, uh, not only for, for its role as the uh, occupying power, but really you know, for uh, doing all that it can to block the peace process uh, while it tends to create facts on the ground. And you know, we've talked about a few, well, we both mentioned a few parallels uh, between Palestine and the issue of Western Sahara. So I'm actually curious, is there a history of solidarity between Palestinians and Sahrawis? Not enough, uh, not as much as one would think uh, there should be. Um, and, you know, those of us who care about the Middle East have, you know, witnessed this, um, you know, this long campaign to basically destroy Arab nationalism, which unfortunately has been led by forces in the region uh, at the behest of forces out, outside the region. Uh, and so the, the long war against Arab republicanism uh, one would think would have brought uh, uh, Palestinians and Western Saharans into closer linkages of solidarity. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, the state in exile, Western Sahara is the Saharan Arab Democratic Republic, and they adopted the, the Arab nationalist flag with a slight modification. Uh, but uh, again, you know, Morocco has really exploited this position as a kind of intermediary between the Arab world uh, the West and Israel because of the large population of Moroccan Jews who emigrated uh, to Israel. I mean, for a long time, the, the Labour Party was uh, significantly constituted by uh, Moroccan Jewish populations. Uh, and King Hassan and then Mohammed VI, the kings of Morocco, have really used those connections uh, very well, not only to uh, win, you know, favor uh, from Washington, right? Every all roads lead to Tel Aviv in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. as we know, right? But uh, to also sort of, you know, advance their own interests. And I think the, you know, Trump's recognition of uh, Moroccan sovereignty or Western Sahara is just the most grotesque display of how Morocco uses its its position in the 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 wider Arab-Israeli conflict and the Israel-Palestinian conflicts. Uh, to get what it wants in terms of, and now, you know, Western Sahara, but other sorts of political interests. And on, on you know, I, there's a couple questions I have for you about Libya and Algeria, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, because um, most of, you know, most of our audience at Breakthrough is American. So from your perspective, why should Americans care about this issue? I mean, aside from the moral basis of it, obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if Americans are really cared about understanding, um, you know, the forever wars, what's uh, the United States relationship with the Middle East, um, and why is it that the United States can't seem to have uh, a more, more sane policy towards the region, Western Star is a, is a part of that, that broader picture. You know, uh, the comparisons with Palestine are also interesting because uh, preventing peace has been one of the primary mechanisms uh, through which the region has been kept unstable. And that instability, which is a, you know, in the 1970s, this was a policy that was deliberately pursued. You know, one of the reasons Kissinger was very excited about Morocco gaining Western Sahara wasn't just because it would help shore up the Moroccan monarchy, which was an important vehicle for American interests, right? After Vietnam, the United States has to figure out how do we control the world without invading it? Yeah. And so they have regional proxies. You know, Iran was the most important proxy in the 1970s. It later becomes Saudi Arabia. But at the Western edge of the Arab world, Morocco was 
really viewed as uh, that other vehicle. But the, the interesting thing about Western Tower was they thought this restored the balance between Morocco and Algeria, and that Algeria was viewed as a, a stronger country until Morocco invaded Western Sahara. But also, what do they mean by balance? Well, the balance really actually means instability, right? There's no clear hegemon, there's constant competition and things of that sort. So if you look at American policy, right, from uh, you know the Western edge of Africa to the Western Himalayas, you have this, the, this approach that has been based upon balancing that sometimes has been interrupted by periods of dramatic intervention, whether it's the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, or more covertly with, with Syria. But it seems as if US policy is much more about maintaining conflicts, mm. uh, prolonging them, right? I mean, the Iran-Iraq war is the, the most egregious example of this, where you know, we gave weapons to both sides. It, mm. you know, it, and as Kissinger said, right, <laughs> you know, too bad they can't both lose, right? But the, right, this US policy of balancing, like offshore balancing, called international relations circles is really a policy of perpetual instability. Uh, and so whether or not explicitly US policy is designed to prevent peace in Palestine and Western Sahara, it's become a part of a larger sort of constellation of relationships that keep the Middle East unstable, which has to do with like the political economy of oil, uh, but also, you know, keeps the US in the region, right? So we, you know, using our Orientalist framework, we say, well, that's just, you know, that's the Middle East. Uh, but it's actually a result of, you know, policy choices that the U.S. has made. And so I want to shift uh, for a moment to Algeria, because uh, we've talked a little bit about it in the context of this issue. But, um, you know, my generation came of age, you know, post September 11th. And we've been scarred by, you know, the Second Intifada, the war on terror, the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, the wars of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, but we know very little about the war in Algeria, and that's despite the fact that it was both you know, shockingly brutal um, with jihadist violence resembling ISIS more recently, yeah. um, and with a cynical government that crushed the insurgency harshly. And in a way, it kind of foreshadowed the conflicts that we'd later see in places like Syria and Iraq and elsewhere. So. I, you know, can you give like a brief, I guess, background of why did that war start and yeah. why was it so brutal and how did it end? Because I think that's so crucial to, um, you know, understanding some of the violence that we see today. Yeah, I mean, the, the depending on what you want to call it, uh, you know, Algerians will often settle on, you know, terms like the dark decade or the black decade of the, of the 1990s. Um, it's difficult to view it as a, a full-scale civil war. The the jihadi insurgency was quite small. It didn't have large amounts of popular support. Um, and yet at the same time, the population didn't really rally <laughs> to the government in, in a very strong way either because of the, as, as you mentioned, it's a, a regime that had lost much credibility. Um, Algeria, you know, its fortunes were quite, um, uh, quite spectacular in the 1970s with oil prices going through the roof, but those collapsed in 1986 and it became very difficult to maintain a project of state building based upon a kind of robust welfare state. Uh, and so popular protests in 1988 broke out. And this is one of the reasons why Algerians didn't really join the Arab Spring, if you want to call it the Arab Spring, in 2011, uh, because they would say, well, you know, we, we did that. We tried that in 1988. It didn't work out too well for us, right? And and some Algerians would say, you know, uh, if other countries had had you know listened, you know, Libya, Syria, things like that, uh, Egypt, right? Uh, that you know, maybe uh, things would have turned out different. Like you know, don't get don't get too excited just because you know the there's a new constitution when the people take to the street. It can lead to ugly things. And Algeria, it very much did because uh, a relatively recently formed Islamist party came together rapidly and almost uh, it took control of. Uh, of municipal and uh, basically state uh, provincial level governments in 1990 and was set to take over the national government in 1991. And the military said, yeah, we, we can't, we, we're not gonna allow this. And so they, they canceled the elections and uh, imprisoned the leaders and you know, sent uh, a bunch of Islamists down to camps. Uh, at the same time, a lot of uh, Islamists who had went to Algeria, part of the Arab Afghans who fought against the Soviet unions, uh, uh, came back to Algeria from Afghanistan in the 
in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and they started forming uh, guerrilla guerrilla groups to to fight against the government. Uh, and so the years 93, 94, we begin to see an escalation in violence and killing and things of that sort. But the the Algerian government, which again, right, this is a government you know whose leaders uh, were formed through counterinsurgency against France in the 1950s and 1960s, and they weren't. Uh, you know, especially certain elements of the regime, we're not going to to tolerate, uh, you know, a wide a widespread insurgency, uh, and so they also embarked upon basically what are dirty war tactics, uh, and this includes disappearances of thousands of Algerians of civilians uh, who've never been really accounted for, uh, and then there became this is very uh, opaque series of massacres that begin to to take place starting you know ninety five. 96, 97, 98, these sort of uh, massacres where hundreds of villagers are killed in a single evening. And we're not, we're not quite sure who was killing who, right? In Algeria, this is a, the who killed who debate is what they, they call it. Uh, there are some indications that the state might have had a role in these massacres, but there are other massacres where clearly it was uh, jihadists who were involved. And so uh, kind of early progenitors of the, the ideology that we associate with the Islamic state, uh, this, you know, where you, you can declare apostasy against Muslims who don't follow you, and that allows you to, to kill them, right? A lot, a lot of this begins percolating in Algeria in the 1990s. Uh, now, the government also, what's interesting, uh, gets a grip on this insurgency by basically paying off a lot of the jihadis uh, and begins to calm things down by saying, okay, we're going to, we'll give you amnesty, uh, we're going to have a forgive and forget pr approach, uh, and we'll give you jobs uh, and maybe mon monthly payments. <laughs> and so if you come out of the mountains, that's the deal. Um, you know, so that's the carrot you see in the stick approach. And it seemed to have worked uh, to, a, to a certain extent, uh, but then a lot of the jihadis moved into the Sahara uh, and that's where the the crisis in Mali begins uh, in the early 2000s, with these groups operating uh, in the in the Sahara region, uh, cultivating support, kidnapping hostages, and things of that sort. But so in the north of Algeria, you you still have sort of sporadic attacks by uh, various uh, jihadi groups associated with the Islamic State or Al Qaeda, uh, but it's nothing like what happened in the 1990s. Uh, and so the regime was more or less able to overcome these challenges. And and again, as oil prices rose uh, following the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, Algeria really began to kind of come back to the international stage and was able to um, sort of try to repair its image as this um, you know, country that had been uh, basically a quasi pariah in the 1990s. You know, it's so incredible the uh, extent to which uh, you can trace so many elements of different conflicts uh, back to these insane Cold War policies yeah. of the 70s and 80s. Um, but with respect to Algeria, uh, more recently, there, there was at least these popular protests in Algeria, kind of like a simmering Arab Spring style disgruntlement. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the um, uh, in 2019, this protest movement began around uh, the possibility that the uh, president, uh, Bouteflika, was going to run again for another term. He'd been originally elected in 1999. Uh, he was uh, reelected with convincing legitimacy uh, in 2005. Uh, 2009, it starts to look like he's setting himself up as a president for life. And then he suffers a series of health crises that leave him kind of wheelchair bound and it's not even clear to what extent he's cognizant of the world around him. So, uh, you know, simply put, the Algerian regime begins to have a kind of weekend at Bernie's uh, sort of feel to it of like, who's really in, in charge? Uh, the president is rolled out as a kind of puppet on a wheelchair and uh, is reelected in, uh, you know, in 20, um, 2014, but, uh, at that point, the Algerians had kind of had enough when it came up again in 2019 that he was going to be uh, elected again. And they said, no, that's, you know, um, you know, we, we felt bad for him in 2014, but this is just ridiculous. And uh, the other problem that had happened was a huge amount of corruption had grown up around the, the ruling uh, regime. And it just became because of the, the huge amounts of oil wealth that Algeria had been generating, again, in the context of the, the global war on terror, 
uh, and then the way that the Arab Spring sent prices through the roof in 2011. And so uh, Algerians uh, were finally willing to go back to the streets. They had shed the fear of the 1990s, this idea that, um, you know, if we protest, it's going to lead to a Libya type scenario, even though that's a kind of like, you know, fear mongering that elements in Algeria tried to suggest. Uh, and so for a long time, there, there was these uh, Friday street protests and then protests by students during the weekdays uh, that were amazingly peaceful, uh, quite uh, inspiring, uh, and led to some changes. But the, the regime in Algeria is still very much uh, holding on. There's a kind of uh, transition that Algeria hasn't gone through yet, which is uh, the basis of legitimacy for a long time, and even today, was uh, a leader's relationship to the war and independence. Uh, now, all those guys are either dead or very aged. So, what is what is political legitimacy in Algeria going forward? If you you know you <laughs> you were born way after uh, the war against against France, right? Uh, and so that's the kind of uh, issues that has to be sorted out. The the Hirak, as it's called, the protests in Algeria are uh, trying to come back uh, despite COVID restrictions and things of that sort. But the Hirak itself hasn't put forward, um, you know, the the population in Algeria is so cynical about politics that it's, it's very difficult uh, to form alternative political movements because it seems as if there's nothing that can't be corrupted. So, uh, Haraq is in a, also in a kind of difficult situation of, you know, uh, wanting to, you know, hit reset on the entirety of the state, uh, but not willing to, um, you know, form the kinds of political movements that uh, could really uh, seize power and, and shift direction in Algeria. Man, that can I can relate to that. Just watching the situation in Lebanon, there's so yeah. many parallels. I think that's a common uh, theme across many developing countries is this kind of, or maybe even developed countries as well, is this sort of like inability to figure out how to build a movement that isn't um, strangled by the same things that are, you know, the same kind of corruption that you mentioned that is yeah. that everybody's so angry about. It seems to just infest everything. Um, yeah. And I wanted to, you know, I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but I have to pick your brain while I have it. I wanted to ask <laughs> you a little bit about Libya. Um, Cause these, I mean, these, these are places that most people don't know much about and also don't hear much about. And with respect to Libya, um, in March of this year, there there was a new interim government that was established. Um, and you've written a lot about Libya in the last 10 years. Um, do you think this new interim government has a chance at succeeding in reunifying this very divided country and restoring some semblance of stability? Um, or is that way too optimistic? Yeah, well, the, the function is basically just to have like, you know, a unity government um, that uh, can guide Libya to elections uh, in this December. And that's going to become the real sort of crisis point is, you know, who's going to run for, you know, president, uh, who are the real viable candidates and can, can they form, uh, you know, because Libya has been operating on transitional authorities uh, since 2011. Um, and that the, the civil war that erupted in, in 2014 basically divided uh, the Libyan governments. And there was an effort in 2016 to try to reunify them through the UN, but that didn't work. Uh, but uh, again, to, to invoke the, the Lebanon example, I think there's a, a feeling of exhaustion that mm. there's no military solution, but uh, that doesn't mean that everyone's willing to kind of <laughs> collaborate and, and forge ahead. So the, the question now is, how will the, the current status quo, you have a country that's basically divided in two um, with the Saharan regions being uh, somewhat much more lawless, but uh, you know, Libya is divided between the East and the West. And so how much will this current status quo in the military situation translate into the, the, the post-conflict uh, situation where basically uh, militias become institutionalized as part of the security apparatus where, you know, quote unquote, warlords become politicians uh, and things of that sort. So that's the kind of questions that w we have to kind of ask ourselves, uh, assuming that, you know, uh, the government of national unity and the UN can get Libya to those elections in December. But that's also a big question. And 
of course, there's also a huge foreign presence in the country. You have a Turkish occupation, you have Russian mercenaries, both sides have imported Syrian fighters uh, to do their dirty work. In the South, you have Dar Darfuri, Tabu, and other ethnic rebels that are being used as mercenaries in, in various locations. So it's quite a complicated uh, situation. Um, and it's difficult to see uh, how it's going to be kind of come together with you know this huge foreign imprint right now. Yeah, this is going to be my next question for you about Libya is the role of these various foreign players and stoking the conflict and then more recently and actually organizing a ceasefire in this new government. And it's everyone. I, you mentioned Turkey, Russia. I mean, yeah, using Syrians from both sides of that conflict as mercenaries yeah. in Libya. And there's also a role of the UAE, of Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. of the, U the U.S. actually has kind of seemed to like back off a little bit. But then there's also like Italy and um, there's yeah. so much involvement in Libya. It's pretty incredible. But yeah. who are the spoilers, I guess, who can undo any of this <laughs> progress, if you can call it progress? Well, internationally, like you said, like Turkey, um, you know, has a huge uh, foot in Libya in the west of the country right now. I mean, they, they have different economic, military security reasons. They were able to get um, uh, basically a, an agreement on offshore oil. The Eastern Mediterranean right now is one of the hugest zones of exploration for petroleum, for natural gas and oil. I mean, you, you know what Israel's doing off the coast of Palestine, but, um, you know, Egypt's interested in that as well. Um, but Russia obviously views uh, Libya as it was a huge arms market for Russia, and it's, it still could be. One of Russia's biggest defense deals ever was uh, on the plate right before Gaddafi uh, was kicked out of power. Um, and Egypt obviously is very much concerned that Libya would become a you know, a base for the Muslim Brotherhood. And so that they had intervened very strongly uh, after 2014 to support this guy, Khalifa Haftar, who um, was a general under Gaddafi, but then, you know, fled and apparently worked uh, for the CIA. And uh, for a while was viewed as, well, maybe this is the authoritarian strongman who can bring everything together in Libya, but Turkish intervention sort of countered that. And so, it's not clear that any, there's no single actor in Libya who can uh, assert hegemony over the country anymore. So it's about getting disparate sets of interested groups, coalitions of militias, things like that. How do you get all these actors to, to, to agree to certain things? And that's the, the big work ahead. Seems like it would have been a good idea to not completely collapse the Libyan state <laughs> <laughs> to begin with, because it's yeah. just like a complete mess now, um, like so many areas of this region. Thank yeah. you so much, Jacob Mundy, Associate Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at Colgate University. I encourage everybody to go check out the piece he wrote for the European Council on Foreign Relations, where he's a visiting, a visiting fellow uh, proposing this new solution to this decades old problem. Uh, with Western Sahara. Jacob, thank you so much. Thank you. It was great.